All right, we go ahead and start on uh, the second half. So this this part is just to call it something different. It's going to be called Chomsky normal form. But it's really the second half of uh, syntactic structures, and then at the end we'll talk quickly about uh, Chomsky normal form, um, which is just it, it's invented to solve a specific problem. Uh, we'll talk about. So chapter six is um, is on the goals of linguistic theory. So. He, Chomsky reads the literature and he, he observes, um, base, I kind of talked about it a little bit before, last time, I talked about what is the goal of a scientific theory. You have a finite number of observations and it should be able to predict future one. You take a finite number of observations, you apply Occam's razor, and uh, you should be able to predict new observations. If you, your theory is unable to predict uh, new observations or new observations don't satisfy your theory, you have to change your theory. Occam's razor basically says the simplest explanation is the best, right? Um, there's no mental gymnastics you have to do. If there's an obvious explanation for it, then that should be uh, it. He notes that there's three kind of goals throughout the literature. And again, it was foundational because somebody else, all these other people did worse things. Oh, the mic wasn't on. All the other people did worse things. He came in and did his thing. And he, and he notes in the literature the following uh, three ideas of what is the goal uh, what makes a linguistic theory adequate? adequate? So he puts forth the following three questions. It, um, the first idea is, is, a, is a strong idea. Uh, you sh it, it, is a theory takes in um, a corpus and outputs uh, a grammar. So a strong linguistic theory, and this is the theory itself, somehow you take, give it, input the sentences, and the theory can explain and output the grammar and, it, and give the grammar itself. Um, this, uh, then he says, well, what about a weaker requirement? The weaker requirement, it basically can give in, it gives in as input a grammar and a corpus itself. And it just outputs a yes or a no. Uh, this is a adequacy requirement for linguistic theory. He says, given a grammar and a corpus, the theory can say if the grammar is a good theory or not. Yes? Sorry, what does corpus mean? Corpus is a set of sentences. So you've given a set of samples. Okay. English may contain infinitely many sentences, but maybe corp the corpus itself is the set of sentences that you would see at, in your lifetime or something. You know? And then he also gives maybe a weakest requirement is that given grammars G1, uh, G2, and the corpus, uh, the grammar outputs which, which, uh, which grammar is a better explanation for the corpus of sentences. So the strongest version is that given a sentence Given a set of sentences, somehow it outputs the grammar itself. That is, he argues that this is too strong of a requirement of linguistic theory. This is, and this is what other people wanted to develop with the linguistic theory, and he says that's too strong. We can't do this. We can't achieve this. Uh, the weaker theory, he says, given a grammar and a corpus, you can determine if the, cor if the grammar fully explains the corpus. If the grammar is, good, is, the, is an explanation for the corpus of sentences. He also says this is too strong. He settles that the weakest requirement, given two different models, one is better than the other, this is satisfactory. And this is good enough. He calls these uh, unreasonable. Uh, he says these are unreasonable requirements because whatever, they, whatever kind of program you may have to build to develop these theories is going to be analytically, analytically complex. It's going to be crazy hard. Notice that really the difference between these two is that in this one, there's no requirement that the grammar itself explain the corpus. It's no requirement that there is, that the grammar itself be satisfied. You know, this one says the grammar explains the corpus. This one produces a sufficient grammar. These are sort of total characterizations of the corpus. Well, this one doesn't have to output 
a correct grammar in any sense. It just has to give a better one. So in some sense, this can these assume maybe there's a total and perfect way to explain English. And this says yet that maybe a grammar to build English cannot be fixed in finite. Like you could not give a literal fixed context-free grammar for English, but rather develop this grammar as a process. Uh, you did yes. So is the weaker one like a decision problem, and the strong one is like search problem? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. There's. I don't remember how his formulation is. This is a problem we're actually going to talk about later. Given a grammar and a corpus, this is a decision problem. This also is a decision problem. This is a search problem, right? Let's relax ourselves from like an algorithm. Algorithmic thinking. Think about a whole scientific theory, like a whole, a whole book on syntactic structures. Which one of these are the problem we're trying to solve? He argues these two are too strong, unreasonable, because they're trying to be perfect. Um, this one is the weakest. And later, I think this, there's the kind of roots here that are developed on something uh, Chomsky later calls the uh, poverty of the stimulus. And this is, I have to preface this by this is not totally well accepted. Like, theory of gravity is well accepted. Not all of Chomsky's ideas are like totally universally accepted, including the poverty of the stimulus. It's not totally universally accepted. But basically, the poverty of the stimulus says is that any, you somehow, you have a baby, okay? You airdrop that baby into a country. It's going to learn the language. Somehow the baby innately knows how to learn the language without learning the language. Without no, it knows, it doesn't, it's no, no baby is born learning a language, speaking a language, so, yet somehow we all have the innate ability to learn a language, right? That's not, that's well accepted, certainly, because babies Google Gaga, right, so on. Um, what Chomsky argues is that no observer is going to be able to learn all facets of the language, because they only can occur from finitely many samples. That's his kind of argument. You, just by speaking the language, you're never going to learn all of English. That's Per, to me, I think it seems reasonable because people have accents. They seem, seem to speak subsets of English. And what the, what the language they speak appears to be, you can only at some point discover a certain subset of it, of it. So this is kind of a root idea here, is that as you, that building the grammar uh, to explain English is not something that can ever be finished. But it is, it is and there's no real output, but rather it's an iterative, pro, iterative process. We were able to give a kind of a grammar for a uh, subset of English, and then we noticed, well, maybe this, we weren't able to explain the, the uh, singular, singularity and plural part. So we were able to update our model, right? So he says you could do this probably forever. That's his kind of idea. You couldn't fix it. Even though in the appendix of the book, he does try and give a, like a really long and complicated grammar for English, right? He actually tries to do this. So this is basically what this chapter is about on the goals of linguistic theory. Like we should be trying to do to do this as a scientific model. We're not going to be doing this as, as if we're doing it, you know, hard hitting science here. Uh, chapter seven. Um, I'm just going to write the the title for completion. Some transformations in English. Uh, this is like way too complex uh, for me to present. It like he actually gets into the nitty gritty de details. This chapter is not one page; it's like fifteen pages. And you know, I, the point is not that we learn English. I don't. I'm not even saying like I don't remember what an adverb is uh, or like a uh, ad adjective. I know an ad I don't remember what an adverb is um, or like what a gerund is. But he uses words that I don't care to learn: morph memes and phone memes and things like this. He gets really into the nitty gritty, and I don't care enough. So we're not going to talk about his specific scientific inquiry into the structure of English itself, but know that he does it. Basically, it's good enough. Okay, it's chapter, chapter seven done. Uh, chapter eight, the explanatory uh, power of linguistic theory. This chapter, it's almost too technical, but instead of explaining the chapter itself, I'm going to give some analogies with physics. So everyone, I think, maybe has taken a physics course at some point. Um, so like, you have a scientific model. It accurately models all previous data you've seen, and it makes future predictions well. Uh, but using the description of the model itself, you can say something about the nature 
of what it's supposed to be describing. So like there's a famous story, like Aristotle, right? No, it was, Ar yeah, it was Aristotle. Um, you know, he drops a feather, right? And like a rock, I'll give it like a willy coyote looking anvil. Right. So he drops the feather in the anvil uh, from the height. And Aristotle predicts that the feather falls slower than the anvil. So uh, the Aristotelian view of gravity is that uh, heavier objects fall faster. That's the Aristotle's view on the thing. And, you know, he's an empiricist. He looks, he has a feather and an anvil, and he drops them, and he notices that the anvil falls faster than the feather. So he says somehow heavier objects fall faster, obviously. Um, Galileo, nobody bothered to check this for like 2,000 years, but then Galileo in, this was like 600 BC. This is like 1,600, 2,200 years. No one bothered to check this for 2,000 years. Uh, Galileo does really a simple thought experiment. And he notices, like, if you were to derive the equation for the speed of the f object falling, that's the model. So you, you look at a few samples, you look at objects falling, you derive an equation, and using the equation, you can make future predictions about what that model says. He notices that the equation doesn't have mass of the object as the function of the object's falling speed. So Galileo... There's a, he, the story is that he drops the anvil and the feather. Actually, it's two different rocks, but let's say it was an anvil and a feather. He drops the anvil and the feather from the top of the Tower of Pisa, and he notices they land at the same time. I think this is actually a myth. What he did was he has a thought experiment about um, two falling objects, and then if one is heavier than the other, what happens if you combine them and then you drop them? Shouldn't they be faster? But then they should be slower if you split them apart. Something like this. He does some thought experiment like this and notices that like there's some contradiction or, uh, uh, or something like this. You can think of this as though, I like to think of this as the, when you derive the equation of motion for a falling object, the variable for mass doesn't appear. It ends up being constant. So because the variable for mass doesn't appear, you can then say the speed of which an object falls is independent of the, of the mass of the object. So that's, this is something that's really common in physics. Like you observe some action and you have some formula, and then you can say something about the formula, right? Like, I don't remember, uh, I don't remember it at all, but the Schrodinger equation has, like, uh, it's, like, H something, but there's an I, like, in an imaginary that appears on one side, but then not the other. So, like, the I appears on one side, but not the other, so you can't really cancel them out. So the Schrodinger equation is, like, specifically requires complex variables. You couldn't re-derive quantum mechanics in a theory without comp using complex numbers, it turns out. Because, and you can say that because the I appears on one side. To give one final analogy from physics is, um, so like Heisenberg, uh, he derives uh, a formula that explains the error in measuring the part a particle's uh, position and momentum at the same time. So he says, like, uh, uh, let h of x uh, be, delta of x be the error in measuring uh, position, and let uh, delta p equal the error in measuring uh, momentum. And then I then the, he derives this equation, delta, and by the way, in the actual thing, these are standard deviations, but we can just say that they're error terms here. He says delta x uh, delta p is strictly greater than uh, some constant h bar over 2, something like this. And so he gets this equation out, and uh, this is, you know, whatever the observations, they, he, he, he conjectures that this equation is the one that, you know, you use several observations of something, you make a prediction of the model, and it, it does predict accurately future predictions. Come on. Come on. Come on. When I walk over here, it's going to... There we go. Is there no, like, permanent on? Is it always motion detected? Yeah, yeah, I think so. That's unfortunate. Oh, well. Anyway, so from here, you can actually derive, like, the human understanding of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, Okay. X, delta X and delta P are the error terms. They both can't be zero. If they're both zero, you have zero is greater than some positive constant. That's impossible. 
So not only does this tell you that, uh, that, that you can't measure both the position and momentum to perfect accuracy, but it mentions as you get more accurate in measuring the position, if you take the limit of delta x to 0, you're going to multiply these by 0. What you're going to get is you're going to get the fact that delta p has to increase in order to satisfy this equation. Right? So you get the fact that the closer you are, the better you are at measuring your position, the worse you're going to be at measuring momentum. And that's quite literally the human interpretation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, so this is no stranger to physics, where you look at an equation, and then you can make a conjecture about the way uh, the universe works or something. Um, Chomsky doesn't do anything with physics here, but he makes some remarks that I don't want to get too technical into about um, the physics itself. Uh, well, not the physics, but about the... Um, like the English, because I don't care about gerunds or morph means or something. But he, he gives the following examples of some sentences. So he says, uh, John ate an apple. John ate an apple is a sentence. Uh, he goes, did John eat an apple? Also a sentence. What did uh, John eat? Uh, who ate an apple? These are all kind of the same sentence with some variation on what's going on here. Uh, this one is a declarative sentence. Um, this one is a yes or no question. Both of these are uh, WH questions, like who, what, where, when, why. And yes or no questions and uh, who, what, where, when, why questions, these are all interrogative sentences. Interrogative? Interrogative? I think it's in interrogative sentences. So there's somehow a dichotomy of kind of sentences you can do. So he, he, he mentions this kind of as like a small example of the dichotomy. And he says, like, there doesn't appear to be uh, an ability of uh, any satisfactory linguistic theory should be able to explain a dichotomy like this in a way that's not ad hoc and not hard-coded, basically. Like, you should be able to explain a, ling a sufficient linguistic theory should explain why these sentences fall in different categories, because you and I are able to say, OK, that's an interrogative sentence. That's a declarative sentence. And all languages appear, not just English, appear to have questions and answers and declarations. So there should be an explanation for the distinction between these. Why, we're able to make this, why do we make a distinction between questions and declar declarations at all? A, a sufficient linguistic theory should explain this. And he says, none of them really do. None of them have the ability to explain this, right? So like, like, a, like the way a physical equation can explain something about uh, the model of physics itself, a model of linguistics should explain this distinction, right? A context-free grammar is not going to really explain this distinction, is it? It's going to, like, maybe you have a different, maybe even if you had a sequence of several small grammars, that's also fine. Like, each, maybe you have a grammar just for declarative sentences and a grammar just for interrogative sentences, that wouldn't be sufficient necessarily because it, isn't, it doesn't explain why they're different. It does, it does explain that they are different, but it doesn't explain why the dico that dichotomy exists. Like why, maybe they do require a different grammatical structure, but why do they require that? He says like there is no, there doesn't appear to be a good explanation through linguistics for this. Okay, that was chapter 8. We're going to go to uh, chapter 9 here, which is on syntax and uh, semantics. 
Right, so we talked kind of last time, uh, kind of really early about the following sentence. We said uh, colorless green ideas sleep uh, furiously. So um, we mentioned that this sentence is grammatical uh, simply by its intonation. And I said we would come back to the difference between syntax and semantics. So this sentence we agreed was grammatically correct. Um, however, it is devoid of semantic value. It doesn't mean anything. So this is a counterexample that there is a relationship between syntax and semantics. So syntax recalls the structure of objects, like data structures or whatever. Literally, semantics is the, semant is the meaning of something. Like what is, I say sentences, and those words have not only structure but meaning. Like I... It, the semantic is, is necessarily dependent on your interpretation of an object, but Chomsky, ar Chomsky argues using that this, these, this that these two objects are, are separate. We give an example of an object that is grammatically correct. It is simply by the way the you know you move the words with your mouth. It's going to be easier to memorize. It's got intonation. It sounds like something someone would say, you know, uh, but it has no meaning. So there, this is a, an example of counterexample between. Syntactic value, syntactic, and semantic. It is grammatical, but it has no meaning, right? Um, so he goes a little bit deeper into this idea. So I'm going to present two other uh, options. He talks about like the field of research of other what other people are doing in the 19. At, at this point, it's old now, the 1950s and 60s. And he, I'm going to call this the loser's hypothesis. So there's many statements he gives, and he tries to give some counterexamples to this one. But the one that is kind of well believed at the time by other people. Um, so, so two utterances, utterances are phenomenally distinct. Uh, if and only if uh, they differ in meaning. This is like uh, some assertion by other people who aren't Chomsky. Uh, two utterances, and an utterance is just as you move your throat and make a guttural noise, and right words come out somehow. That's an utterance. I could have actually, I could have said sentence would have been fine here. Language is both spoken and written. So two utterances are phenomenal. Phenomenic, phenomenically distinct. Basically, they sound different. So two utterances sound different if and only if they differ in meaning. This is an assertion. Like, it, if two things mean something different, then they sound different. That sounds like if and only if they sound different. Two things sound different, they mean different. If two things mean different, they should sound different. Okay? This is an assertion kind of like there is a relationship between syntax and semantics. Right? Two things, if two things mean something different, then they should be syntactically different. If two things sound the same, then they should mean the same. So this is an assertion by other people. And Chomsky gives counterexamples uh, both ways. So he says left to right is false and right to left is false. So again, uh, let's let's just go through them left uh, to right. So left to right, what are some counterexamples? Two utterances are two utterances sound different if and only if they are different in meaning. So to come up with a counterexample of this, we should come up with something that um, sounds different but means the same thing. So he, there's actually tons of examples. You could probably come up with it. Let's, do you guys have any examples of something that sounds different but means the same? I like that one. Like, he drank water and like he drank H2O. It's literally synonyms, yes. So the example he gives is uh, batch, the pair of words bachelor and unmarried man. These are synonyms. Um, 
And again, we, didn't have, we, we, we said the word utterances, so we didn't have to talk about distinct sentences. So we could just separate your example and just take water and H2O. Literally, they mean, they mean the same thing. There's no way that water is distinguishable H2O, I don't think, right? But yeah, so those two are different utterances, yet they have the exact same semantic meaning. Okay, same thing with bachelor and unmarried man. Synonyms is a counterexample for this uh, left to right. But also, there's plenty of other ones. Like, it's not even necessary that, that they you be synonyms. People have accents. So he uses, and there's, if you ever notice on like Wikipedia, they use all those weird symbols when they try to explain how a word is pronounced. I don't know what those symbols mean, so, but, and he uses those symbols, but I translated them. Um, the following two pairs of words, economics and economics. Okay, economics, economics, those are different utterances, yet they mean the same thing. Not only, it's quite literally just an accent variation. Uh, he even gives uh, one final one, adult and adult. Right? So adult, adult, you guys, which I don't know which one you guys say. Everyone has some saying. These aren't even dependent on an accent, I think. I don't think economics and economics is an accent thing. I'm not sure. I think it's not frequent enough of a word for people to know if that's part of an accent. I think it's... I think it's just a preference kind of thing, like whoever you learn it from, right? Economics. Caramel versus caramel. Yes, exactly, exactly. I say the L in salmon. People tell me not to say it, but it's there. I have to say pterodactyl. I, I pronounce words. Um, do you say often? Often? Do you say often? What, 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 what do you often? say? Often. Often? Um, yeah. Often. That sounds, I don't like that. <laughs> often, often. I ask you a question, you know. My English is, is pretty, you can tell someone's read a lot and doesn't speak a lot. You know, I went years thinking it was Hermione, and then I went to Universal Studios, and it was like Hermione, and it was like, what, <laughs> what are you talking oh. about, you know? It's Hermione, okay. Um, right, so this is, these are some counterexamples of left to right. We can give counterexamples of right to left as well. So what are two words that mean the same thing, but no. What are two words that differ in meaning, but then sound the same? Whole and whole. Whole and whole. Right? Is that the holes you meant? Okay. Yeah. So I, uh, let's suppose we weren't talking about, these sound the same, but they're spelled different. Can we come up with an example that is even spelled the same? Not even written differently. Because maybe, an, maybe, Maybe you could infer the different meaning from the spelling, but not from the speaking. Can you come up with two example, can an example of words which are identical, both spoken and written, however, mean different things? Break and nice. break. Like, uh, like we just went on break. Those are still spelled differently, aren't they? No, they're not. No, no, no. I was thinking of break, <laughs> like a break light. Break, break, and break. So yeah. Break is a good example. You can break something, and you can go on a break, right? The example Chomsky gives is bank, as in a river bank, and bank, as in a uh, place you put money in. What about there, there, there? There, there, there? Yes, that also work. Oh. Can you talk about it? No. But those are, those are utterances, but not spelling. So I guess I think this example and the break example are probably the best, because here you may be able to infer the definition, the meaning from the spelling, if, but not from the spoken. Same thing with there, there, and there. Maybe the spelling you can infer it, but not from the spoken, not from the utterances, yeah. right? So these are some examples of, the, uh, of his counterexample. He even, oh, the final one is even words that are, sound the same, but are spelled differently, is metal and metal. This is really a consequence of the English accent, where we, the American accent, excuse me, where we say Ds and Ts, you know, little, Little doesn't, right? Right. We say little, but everyone know if I if you were transcribing what I'm saying out loud, you would not write this. You would write this because you know that I'm speaking in the accent. So that's same thing, right? Um, so at his final example. I'll give one more counterexample to uh, a separation between uh, syntax and semantics. So. He noticed like the weakest, um, the weakest semantic property is uh, 
factual correctness. Weakest uh, semantic property is uh, factual correctness. So a sentence has a truth value associated with it, usually, right? Like if it's true or false, this is a semantic property. The sentence may be grammatical but may be false. The sentence may be grammatical, may be true. So the truth or falsehood of a sentence, of a statement, is a semantic property and not a syntactic one, right? There are, there's an elephant in the room. It has semantic value false because there's no elephant in the room, but it is grammatically correct, right? So it is, it is a semantic property, certainly, the truth value. Um, so it is not only a semantic value, but it is the weakest semantic value. It's like impossible to misinterpret. Like mo most people would agree always the same way on the semantic property. Like by strongest, we mean like, there is a very strong consensus, always true or always false. Uh, other semantic properties may have like 60, 40, 70, 30 agreement on, uh, on what the semantic value of, of, of a sentence is. So truth is certainly the weakest property because it's the most agreed upon. Uh, everyone agrees when something is true or when something is false. He notes then like uh, active and the asyntactic property is uh, if a sentence is active or passive. So a sentence being active or a sentence being passive is a, semantic, is a syntactic property of the sentence itself. But he notes in the following example, everyone in the room knows at least two languages. At least two languages are known by everyone in the room. So those are two sentences, okay? The first says, uh, everyone in the room knows at least two languages. The second one, at least two languages are known by everyone in the room. One is active and one is passive, and they almost say the same thing. However, they differ in semantic value. So syntactically, here, uh, the semantic value is not even preserved under the syntactic, the syntactic transformation. Taking a sentence, transforming it from active to passive or passive to active can change the truth value, can change the semantic meaning of the sentence itself. So everyone in the room knows at least two languages. That means for each person in the room, you know two languages. This is false. You come up with one counterexample. I know one language. One language. Uh, at least two languages are known by everyone in the room. So does anyone speak a language other than English? Wow, OK. What languages do you speak? English, Hindi, and then some French. French, it's Hindi. OK, what about you? Spanish and English. OK, so that's total like <coughs> English, Hindi, Spanish, French, that's like four, right? So the following, at least two languages are known by everyone in the room. The bottom sentence is true because that's four languages and four is at least two. The top sentence is false because I can't speak anything other than English, right? So we've changed the sentence from active to passive and now the truth, the semantic value has flipped from truth to false, right? False to true. Right? Why is the bottom one false? Uh, the bottom is true. Oh. At least two languages are known by everyone in the room. Four, we know four languages total. At least two oh, languages. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. But then everyone in the room, this is a statement about the room, and this is a statement about the people in the room, right? right. So that's what really, that's what makes it change. So we note that even like the weakest syntactic property, the weakest semantic property, factual correctness, can, be, can change by simply changing a, a, a perturbance of the syntax. So what's the moral here is like grammar cannot describe um, semantics. You could not say, like, let this non-terminal uh, produce only sentences with correct semantic value. 
right? You can use grammar to construct sentences which are syntactically correct. You could never do, you could never, he says you couldn't even try to do something like this that constructs sentences which are semantic, that have semantic value. You could not put a construct, you could not construct meaning in this way, right? You could take two sentences that have meaning, compose them, and suddenly you have a sentence without meaning, right? Yes? Could you say the moral? The moral is you could not use syntax to study semantics. You could not construct a grammar for only the sentences with meaning. It's going to be the sentences with R, which are grammatical. Okay. You, there is no device to study. Unlike the devices we're constructing to attempt to study grammar and correctness, grammaticalness, you could not construct a grammar which um, measures and understands meaning, right? You change a small property of the sentence here, and now the semantic value is changed. Like, let's say you, you did have some grammar that only generated true statements. Well, I don't, I don't know. That's, it's impossible, right? Uh, composition of true statements may be false or something, right? So you couldn't say, oh, well, now I'm doing an if then or something, right? This is, the, this is like the, the, the concluding argument here. So chapter uh, 10 is the summary. Uh, so there's 10 chapters. Um, the summary is like a page and basically just goes through everything we did so far. Uh, we talked about basically like you have to have a, it, the point of syntactic structures again, I didn't cover like chapter seven and I skipped some of chapter five because it's too deep into the actual um, science, quote unquote, but I don't, and that's the parts I don't care about. I don't care about the English. I care here that the, the moral here is you go is that you come in with the scientific viewpoint and you're better than everyone. That's the, the idea. You understood uh, foundational theory building. And this is really the importance of theory. This course is really about theory itself, uh, the theory of theory. And using that, you can say incredibly powerful things that people have failed to say for generations. You know, yes. Why does he say like science we're better than other people? No, that's what I'm saying. Oh. So, so, yeah. I mean, the, the point is linguistics was like a really empirical field. It's like you field workers, and he gives some examples of this. And uh, the, the, the methodology is flawed, he says. He comes in. He doesn't go in the field. He's sitting in a lab or whatever, and he's, and he's postulating about structure. And just from that, he's able to derive crazy, crazy results. You know, we were like one of the things we said at the beginning was that English doesn't have regular substructure. And just from understanding that, we could understand something about ourselves. Like, the brain is full of wires and pipes, yet it is finite, finite matter, so maybe it decides a finite language. But under this viewpoint, like, because English, could, because we can recognize uh, things that which aren't uh, English, excuse me, that aren't regular, we, the way our wires and pipes are linked up can't be that similar to a DFA. It has to be something closer to a context-free grammar. It's closer to a context-free grammar than it is closer to a DFA. So we can say something, so say something neurologically about ourselves that we couldn't say just from kind of examples and counterexamples this way, right? So we're just like kind of talking about the difference between humans and computers? We'll talk about that a lot more okay. later. But this is purely on a study of grammar, like grammaticalness, right? So there are some, we, there, some, some things are hard to define. Grammar is certainly something that's hard to define. So uh, and this is, it, it spawned, you know, the next half century of work in linguistics is, 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 is the significance here. Like you, uh, it's hard to characterize exactly when a sentence is grammatical and when it's not grammatical. Mm -hmm. However, we're able to, you can look at a sentence and say. So somehow you have an internalized definition of, you know when a sentence is grammatical or ungrammatical. But it is difficult for you to explain to someone why a sentence is grammatical or ungrammatical without explaining, the, making them learn the entire language. So there isn't a succinct description you can give of the property grammatical or the property ungrammatical. You cannot explain to someone grammatical or ungrammatical as well as you could. Well, what do English teachers do? English teachers teach you the language and you learn by example. So you go through yeah. and you're beaten, it's beaten into you. When is a, you, you know, you make several mistakes. Somehow you're able to, uh, you know, speak. You can you somehow after this process of years of schooling, you're able to produce correct sentences most of the time. You know, I probably used incorrect grammar officially today at some point. You know, I don't know. 
Um, so this is syntactic structures. That's basically the idea. It was foundational not even because it's right about any of the stuff necessarily, but it's the fact that he came in with this specific viewpoint. So that's something I want to emphasize. Um, we'll talk now about uh, Chomsky normal form, which is the whole point of today's lecture. Uh, so he solves uh, Chomsky normal form. He solves what's called the acceptance problem for CFGs. So basically, like given uh, uh, CFG G and uh, where W uh, does. Uh, G produce W. So like you're given a grammar and you're given a specific word and you want to determine if the grammar produces that word. Um, how do you do this? This is actually kind of a hard problem if you think about it. How do you determine if a grammar produces a specific word? You just go through the rules. How do you know that you, but grammars, I can come up with some very complicated grammars. How do you know, the grammar itself is also non-deterministic. So you know the DFA accepts the word by running the DFA on the word. You kind of know the NFA accepts the word by trying all possible paths of the word. Mm -hmm. How do you know if a grammar produces the word? So it's got a problem of also not being an acceptor, like an NFA or DFA, and not being deterministic. So it's got two problems here. This is actually turns out a non-trivial problem, and it's not even obvious that it's solvable. right? Turns out it is. So we invent this thing called uh, Chomsky normal form. He invents this to solve this problem. Uh, two quick remarks on, Chomsky, uh, on the naming of Chomsky normal form. If you ever want a theorem named after you, if you discover something original, you should name it really generically. So it'll, people, it'll annoy people, and they'll call it, uh, they'll, let's call it Chomsky's normal form. And then, then it just sticks as Chomsky normal form, right? I also think the author on the original paper, there was two authors, but no one remembers the second guy. So it's Chomsky's, it's Chomsky normal form because, because of that. I think it was called normal form, like the normal form of grammars. And that's annoying because there's many things called normal form, right? Turing originally called, he didn't call them Turing machines. We'll talk about those are later. But he, he called them automatic machines or like A machines. And then you can't keep saying A machine over and over. You have to call it. There's other people who invent machines. You can't call those B machines, right? So you, you have to call his machine the Turing machine and then the other machines, their machines, right? So that's, how you, that's what, a way you can get a thing named after you maliciously is like you name it something. Not saying they did this on purpose, but you just name it generically to be enough to be annoying. It has to be, of course, original, but it has to be you know, annoying, right? Do, do you remember the other guy's name on the Chomsky paper? Muller? M something? Maybe? I could be totally wrong. I mean, they did a lot of phenomenal science. I'm sure he had a successful career, but it, we call it Chomsky no, normal form for a reason, right? Um, right, so basically he says uh, a, a CFG, a context free grammar, is in uh, CNF if, it, if the following are true. Um, all rules look like uh, capital A goes to B, C, uh, capital A goes to little a. Uh, S goes to epsilon if and only if uh, epsilon is produced by the language. And uh, S appears on no right-hand side of any rule. So what this means is the rules of a grammar in Chomsky normal form has these four conditions on it. Every rule is either one non-terminal goes to two non-terminals, or one terminal non-terminal goes to one terminal. Right, so this I could write this like this, I guess. V goes to VV, or V goes to sigma. Right, so you have to go to two non-terminals. Does that say VV? Yeah, okay. not W. Yeah, yeah. You have to go to two non-terminals, or one terminal. 
cannot do little terminal, big terminal, little terminal, big terminal. Uh, you're only allowed an epsilon rule if epsilon is in the language. And it has to be from the start, right? Also, the start symbol appears nowhere on the right-hand side. The start symbol only comes on the left-hand side. You can't ever recurse back from the start. Recurse somewhere else. Who cares? But you can't recurse back from the start. That's what this means. So it turns out that every grammar uh, can be converted to one in Chomsky normal form. So if I were to write this using our, our, our notation, certainly, certainly every grammar in Chomsky normal form is a context-free grammar because this is a restriction of the rules. A context-free grammar is a generalization of the rules. So every, Chomsky, every grammar definable in Chomsky normal form is definable in, is a context-free grammar. But it turns out you can also convert every context-free grammar into one in Chomsky normal form. So to put, the, put it like this, every grammar, which is a context-free grammar, is actually also uh, equivalent to one which can be put in Chomsky normal form. So we're going to convert a CFG into one in CNF form by just showing a process to convert a grammar into CNF form. That's what we're going to do. And the way you do it is you just apply these rules. Um, add, uh, so one add new uh, start state. Uh, S0 goes to S. So by applying this rule, you've satisfied the, first con the fourth condition already. Right, you've now made it so S0 is the new start state, and because it's new, it never appeared on the right-hand side. So now it doesn't matter where S appears on the right-hand side. You've, you've now just added a new dummy thing. So you've satisfied this, that condition. Two, um, remove rules of length zero. Rules of length zero are the epsilon rules. So you remove the epsilon rules that appear throughout the thing. And you do this by patching uh, back. So you like, you like hard code the productions that you, all the possible productions you could take had you taken the epsilon rule. And then you just store those productions as like new rules. So what that means is like um, if you at R goes to like UAV and then A uh, goes to epsilon. What you do is you consider all productions if you took this epsilon anyway, and you remove it. So now you would convert this to like R goes to U, A, V, or U, V. See what I did there? I took the A and I just hard-coded this as if I, if I have this rule, so wherever A would appear, I replace it with the epsilon, and then I get something back. So now after you apply this, all rules should have length... Uh, greater than or equal to 1, because you remove the rules of length 0. Then you're going to remove the rules of length 1. What does the rule of length 1 look like, by the way? If the, uh, the right-hand side has length 1. It's one character? Yeah, like one non-terminal. We call this a unit rule, so A goes to B. So we're kind of a, oh my god. OK. Um, right, so we, 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 these are called unit rules. Uh, the way you do it is you just patch it again. So you go like, let's say A goes to B and B goes to C. You just delete B. You just say A goes to C. Right? Anything A goes to B, anything B could go to, you just put that A goes to that. Right? Even if this was like C, D, E or something, you go D, E. Right? You just hard code the shortcut for itself. Right? OK. Um, if it was just B goes to C, wouldn't it still be a unit rule? Like A goes to C? That is true. And then you would delete that unit rule. So you may have to apply it re re repeatedly. It'll make sense if we do an example. Um, but this is just kind of this argument is to um, show that every grammar can be converted to a CFG. Then we'll, then we'll do the example. And the final one is you convert rules of length, um, convert. So we remove rules of length 0 and we remove rules of length 1. Now we're going to remove rules of length greater than 2 and make them into rules of length 2. of length uh, greater than 2 into rules 
of length of two. So what this means is like uh, if you have like um, a goes to u1, u2, u3, uk, uh, all you're going to do is replace every um, uh, you can break this up into a sequence of dummies, and then you now have that as your rules. So instead, you're going to go like, uh, instead of A goes to U1 and UK, you're going to go to A goes to U1, this thing, and then this thing is produced by a dummy. So this is going to be A goes to U1, A1, A1 goes to U2, da, 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 UK. Right? So... Now we have one rule of length k to two rules, one of length 2 and one of length uh, k minus 1. K minus 1, yeah. You, re you repeat this until all rules are of length at most 2. Um, and then finally, uh, any uh, a goes to b, c rule. Replace, I'll say this for replace. Uh, terminals in any right hand side by dummies by dummy rules. So like if you had A goes to like a little b c, you're going to replace this by A goes to capital B C and then B goes to little b. Right? We just uh, Replace the little b by a big B, and then a big B goes to little b. What is that word? It's the next rule? Dummy. Oh. Yeah. So what's the point of CNF? Um, I'm going to keep using some more board space so I don't have to erase this procedure. So the point of CNF is like uh, if a G is in uh, CNF, uh, to produce a word of length uh, n takes exactly 2n minus 1 productions. So this solves the acceptance problem for C of Gs. What you do is you convert the grammar to CNF. Enumerate all productions of length 2n minus 1. If your word is in that list of productions, congrats, it accepts it. If it's not in that list, then you don't accept it. So what, let's prove this. And we're going to give also, and n, is, n has to be you know, greater than or equal to 1. So n can't be the empty string because that takes 2n minus 1. Length 0 would be minus 1 productions, right? So you can't do that. So that's a, like an outlier case. Uh, let's prove it. Let's suppose you had wanted to produce w string w1 to wn, right? Let's work backwards. If you have string w1 to wn, uh, notice that the rules of, of, of CNF, you can do two things in, for, per production. You delete one non-terminal and add two. So you're net one non-terminal. Or you replace one terminal, one non-terminal by a terminal. What that means is, if you had n terminals, each terminal could come from exactly one non-terminal. So what this means is, at some point in the past, and it depends on the order that you would make the production, this comes from w1 to wn, where each wn, wi produces w, little wi. We're rewinding a little bit. Each uh, non-terminal produces one terminal. So each terminal can come from exactly one non-terminal. We, 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 we rewound uh, to this stage. Now, each terminal, at some point, you have to start somewhere. So this string comes from the start non-terminal S. Right? The start here means multiple productions are coming from here. How do you go from, uh, how many productions does it take to go from n non-terminals to n terminals? Just this, just this step here. How many terminals does it take to go from n terminal, n non-terminals to n terminals? N. Yeah. Each one takes one production. There's n of them. Takes n. 
how many productions does it take to go from the start variable if you want it to have a string of n non-terminals? Well, n, you have n non-terminals. At each production, you add exactly one terminal, but you start with one. n minus 1. So for, to go from the start symbol to a string is going to always take uh, two n minus 1 productions. Right? You add n and n minus 1, 2 n minus 1. Every production takes n minus 1, 2 n minus 1. Just to say the point of this one more time, the point of Chomsky normal form, it's going to produce uglier and worse looking grammars, but the point of it is simply that you get to this, you can now say for certain, you give an algorithm to show that a grammar produces a word. Convert the grammar to Chomsky normal form as following this procedure. Enumerate all productions of 2 n minus 1, of length 2 n minus 1. Maybe it's a big list, whatever. And then just check if your word is in that list. If it's in, in the list, then you've solved the problem, right? So this gives a direct grammar, a, a direct way to do it. I'm running a little bit out of time, but I'm going to give you one quick example. So we're just going to convert um, the grammar for a to the n, a b to the n, into Chomsky normal form. The grammar for this was like as goes to asb, or epsilon, right? So we're going to convert this into Chomsky normal form. Uh, following the rules. First, we're going to add a new start state. So we're going to go s goes, s0 goes to s, comma, s goes to asb, or epsilon. Um, now we're going to remove rules of length 0. Uh, we're going to remove this rule of length 0 and propagate it forward. So what does that mean we get? We're going to get... Uh, S0 goes to S or epsilon. S goes to ASB or AB. Right? So now we've put the rule that the epsilon is in the language. So we're allowed to only have it at the start symbol. S is now not the start symbol. S is now some other symbol. And it does not have an epsilon rule. So we're good. Um, now we need to convert rules of length 1. How do we do that? Uh, we're going to replace this s by, by all productions of s. So we're going to go uh, s0 goes to asb or ab or epsilon. And we're going to keep s. s goes to asb or ab. Right? So we've copied this for here. This is a unit rule. We're going to replace this s by this. That's all we've done here. Each line corresponds to an update, and by the end, I'll have done a grammar in CNF form. Um, now I need to replace the rules of we replace the rules of length zero. We replace the rules of length one. We're going to replace the rules of length greater than two. Here's a rule of length greater than two. Here's a rule of length greater than two. And sometimes you can just quickly see like what's going on and do it uh, appropriately. So I'm going to go like s zero goes to a, and I'll say x, or a, b, or epsilon. S goes to a, x, a, b, and then x goes to s, b, right? Just some substring replacement. I replaced s, b by x goes to s, b. So this is, should be, it's still the same. Again, when you make each change, you want to make sure you don't change the the grammar, what it produces, just the, the, the syntactical representation of it. Um, then I have all these terminals here, so I'm just going to replace them by what they're appropriate to be. S0 goes to capital AX, or capital A, capital B, epsilon. S goes to capital AX, or capital A, capital B, or, uh, no, or nothing. X goes to... Uh, capital S, capital B, and then we have A goes to little a, and B goes to little b. Right, so this final line is in Chomsky normal form. Can we confirm? Looks, yep, that's in Chomsky normal form. So we've converted the grammar into a horrible and worse looking one. However, it is in Chomsky normal form. Why did you have to change the little a, b to the capital a, b? To follow the rules. But the rules 
Every yeah. rule has to be like this, right? Little a, big A goes to little a, or big A goes to two non-terminals. Oh, it can only go to one lowercase. Yeah. Right. Right. The point is we want to have this two and minus one property. So basically, all this does is add more productions, but it guarantees it's going to have exactly two and minus one. We could have not, maybe if we didn't have that, we could say at most two and minus one, but then you have to keep all the intermediate ones and, you know, something like this. Um, so let me prove to you, uh, let's, let's produce AABB uh, -B with this grammar. AABB is, is, is what? Uh, it's a string of length four, so it should take seven productions, right? So let's just check that it does seven. How would I do this? S is going to go to, so S0 is going to go to uh, AX, which is going to go to, uh, X is going to go to SB. So we have ASB which is going to go to, and S is going to go to AX. So we have A, A, X, B, and then X is going to go to SB. So we have A, A, B, we have A, A, S, B, B. No, I should replace X here not by AX, but by A, B. Right? Right? S goes to AB. Yeah, okay. Um, then this is going to be replaced by little a, a, b, b, um, a, little a, little a, big B, big B. Uh, little a, little a, little b, big b. Uh, little a, little a, little b, little b. Right, and now we're done with the string. Uh, why did I do this so we can count? One, two, these are the same. Three, four, five, six, seven. So string of length four, we have two times four minus one equals seven. So it does take seven productions. Uh, to produce a string of length four. All right, that's Chomsky normal form. That's the point of Chomsky normal form. We can decide the acceptance problem for CFGs. Um, that's everything I have for today.